I'm Jason, and you're watching For Art's Sake. Hi, I'm Jason Piat. I'm an artist in Chicago. And this work that's in this exhibition today here at Parkland is a mixture of pieces that are installations like this, site-specific to a point installations, as well as objects. And all of my work uses light in some way um, to create shadows that either represent something, some sort of information, whether it's geographic or demographic population based, or just um, uses light or shadow as a way of, of tying the work to the space to, to create that, that sense of installation. So this piece um, is a relatively large piece. It's got kind of a long title that's a string of, of letters that, re that are the abbreviations of each of the 10 most populated states in the United States. So California, Texas, New York, Florida, Illinois, and so on. So each of these little blocks are each of those 10 states. And then these sticks, these acrylic rods that come out of them are a representation of the population of those states. So this is, this is Illinois here. So each of, the, each of the sticks coming out of there represents um, two million people. So then all the sticks kind of intertwine, kind of representing as a, as a whole, the vast majority of the population of our country. And the light, you know, this is kind of a piece that sort of um, falls somewhere in between true large site specific installation and sculptural object. And, the, and really what's making that, that connection between there is, is the light and shadow. So with pieces like this, what I want to happen, or what I want to be the effect, is that the composition that's on the wall, which are you know, these kind of complex composition of shadows, is somewhat more intriguing or more evident or stronger than the actual physical elements of the piece that are making, making those shadows. So that kind of has multiple layers to the piece. So these two pieces in the show are, are less installation and more, more sort of traditional sculptural objects. Um, they still have kind of varying levels of interaction with the light, this one more so than this one. Um, but the, but the, in this particular piece, the mapping is a bigger, is a bigger factor in the piece. So this is a, the proportions of a map of the United States um, in a certain kind of map called a Mercator projection map, which is um, a 90 degree map of the US. So each of these, each of these dots, which have, have numbers on them, represent the, the locations of the 25 most populated cities in the United States. So this is, this is the East Coast, New York, Philadelphia, um, the Midwest, Chicago, Milwaukee, Indianapolis, Texas, up through California, Seattle, Denver. And, and I've got a number of pieces that use that same map. And what I like about them is, is the kind of level of abstraction, how it's sort of a very, a very simple, minimalist kind of composition, but it's actually a direct presentation of information. So it kind of operates on, on two levels, I think. And then this piece, which is a um, kind of a small version of, of the larger installation, is you know a small little little miniature installation that again uses the light and has this kind of shadow composition, and this piece is a is a a section of part of Illinois and part of Indiana, and each of these rods within the piece connects the exact location in each of the two states where there are two cities, one in Indiana, one in in Illinois, that have the same name, so it's connecting. Um, Clinton, Illinois, to Clinton, Indiana, Monticello to Monticello, Danville to Danville, and so on. So I want to include this piece in the in this exhibition because here at Parkland we're you know we're in Champaign, which is within the the space of this piece. So this installation is 
called Senders 2. And this is a, a piece where, again, like I was saying with the previous installation, where the object is kind of one, one aspect of it, and then the composition on the wall behind it, the light and the shadows, it's happening as sort of the, the second layer of the piece. This is, this is a, a representation of Illinois and Wisconsin, which are the two states that I'm from, half my life in Wisconsin and, or so, and half in Illinois. And, and the, the wood slats in each of the piece represents the populations of those two states. So you can see you know, the, the density difference in the Illinois piece versus the Wisconsin piece, and that, that um, dictates what they do on the wall, the amount of light that leaks out of them. So this piece is typical of the materials that I use in a lot of my, in a lot of my large work and a lot of um, bigger, bigger installations. So this is um, fabricated aluminum and, and stainless steel hardware. And then those, the wood slats are poplar, which is a wood that I, that I am really drawn to because it has a lot of variety to it. It, it, um, it has lights and darks and different grain patterns and, and it kind of feels to me like it represents what I want it to represent, which is uh, masses of, of different populations. And you know, I kind of get that from, from the piece. This, all, this piece also has um, frosted acrylic slats in it, um, which, are, which are not there for population reasons or for any sort of informational reasons, but, but um, formally to kind of, kind of diffuse the light and, and, and add another layer to what the shadows are doing. Um, in this piece, like in all my pieces, I, I very rarely, almost never, um, color or mask any material. I really like the the raw material or the look of, of materials, aluminum, wood, acrylic, light, whatever it is. So I don't use color light, I don't paint the wood. Um, this, is, this is sort of a good representation of, the, of those typical materials for me. And then this piece, the last series of things that I have in this exhibition, this is a, a series of five um, photographic collages that I made based on that map that we talked about earlier. So this is that same map proportions of the United States. And each of these five pieces has, has a, um, a line, two lines representing a latitude and a longitude line that, that shows the, the coordinates, which is the title of the piece, coordinates, that shows the coordinates of each of the five most populated cities in the United States. So this is, this is New York, this is Los Angeles, Chicago, and, and so on. Um, and then the, the imagery in the pieces are photographs of a, of a temporary installation that I did a few years ago at a gallery, and they're collaged in to kind of, to kind of show a little bit like these installations to kind of show light sort of emanating out or energy emanating out from those places, those actual places. So these really are, as abstract as they are, they really are functioning as maps. So this exhibition is coinciding <laughs> with the completion of a, of a large installation that I did that was commissioned for the campus, for here at Parkland, for the new Applied Technology Center, which is out on the west side of campus. Um, and I, I did a large uh, piece in the same kind of materials as this, this hanging piece, wood and aluminum, and, and it's in the, the center of that building, and it kind of represents the, the populations that feed into Parkland's, Parkland's district. Hi, um, my name is Doug Jepson. I'm an associate professor of fine arts at Wabanza Community College. And a little about my work. This is a, a, a bourbon bottle that's uh, been wood fired, and uh, um, it's, I, I work with a wood fired bee mix. It's a clay that I developed with Laguna Clay Company. So on this piece, there's not any glaze whatsoever. So this happens specifically in the firing process. So it's a clay that was developed to react with the wood firing process. It's, it's a, thrown as a, as a uh, um, hollow tube 
tops, bottoms are added, everything. So there's about six or six different attachments on here. Once it's been once it's been bisque and ready for the kiln, it's fired on its side on seashells. And what happens here is this is the wood ash that moves through. It's fired in, in the Anagama at the college, and we we fire for about 80 hours. It takes a couple days to load. Um, so it's a Wednesday. It's it's a um, Wednesday, Thursday load sometimes and then five days to fire from, from there. So we, we spend a, a good amount of time firing looking, looking at that. And uh, so what happens here is when we're firing with, with lumber, the, the, the wood is actually becoming the glaze material in itself. So this is all wood ash. If you've ever been to a campfire, you throw a log on the fire and all those little sparks that come up. Well, that actually comes into the kiln, lays on the work, and then when we take it up and actually melts and forms a glaze surface in here. So we'll fire in those five days and we'll burn about six cords of, of lumber, which is, you know, one cord is four feet by four feet by eight feet. So imagine that um, six feet of that times, uh, times six feet going through the kiln. And then we'll run another two cords through the side of the kiln. So we're running about eight, eight cords of wood in one firing over about 80 to 90 hours. Um, my students are there around the clock. So we, uh, we work in about uh, um, four people, four and a half hour shifts. So it's a big communal activity, but uh, um, with, with all of my different students that are working, we'll bring in visiting artists to work with students as well. So that's kind of a nice, it's a, it's a great teaching tool that moves through. But the nice thing about it is you don't ever get two that are exactly alike. They're, they're gonna be a, in a family, but they're gonna be a, um, a little bit different. You can always kind of tell the resemblance there, but they're gonna change. So this kind of moving through these flash marks that happen and as, as that moves in. But this would have been sitting like this in the kiln and then the wood ash kind of moving through. So it's a, it's a great way to be able to freeze that fluidity that's what's happening in this material. That's kind of the beauty of it is the softness that you get when you're working with it. In the firing process, you can kind of capture that fluidity and then you can freeze that and, and uh, you get these vertical wraps on this, uh, these uh, horizontal wraps on this uh, vertical form here. So that's, uh, that's kind of a nice, nice aspect that begins to happen. So, so here's uh, three, three, uh, three flasks that are in a, uh, um, a uh, wooden box that's been charred to resemble a uh, um, charred white oak barrel is, is how uh, um, bourbon is, is, is aged. And so in these, in these pieces, you actually have, these are, these are gonna be thrown as a tube symmetrically round, and then they've been without a bottom so I can compress them, change, alter, and move this. I can begin to freeze this material. So it really responds to touch. And so they're thrown and altered, um, tops are added, um, bottoms are added, and then the spout is, is added as well. But it's a, it's a great way to, uh, you know, this, this material responds to touch like, like nothing else. And it's a, it's, a, it's a way to capture the uh, fluidity of the material. And along with wood firing, you're able to, to capture the fluidity of what's happening in that, in that kiln over the uh, three, four, five days. Um, we'll fire in a couple different kilns. In the Anagama I talked about, we'll fire in the train kiln as well. It's a design from Utah State University. So the Anagama is an Asian um, descent. The uh, train kiln is, is really an American Ived version, which is kind of interesting, from uh, um, John Neely and Utah State University. So, being able to pull that, and we've got five different wood kilns at the college that we've been able to build with my students. And so, we'll fire these several times a semester. Where um, the gas kilns inside or electric kilns, there's a fuel source that's there. You program electric kiln that goes up; it does its thing. Same with the gas kiln; you you change valves and, and allow more fuel in. With a wood kiln. We're there overnight. So whether it's a 48 hour firing or a 90 hour firing, we're there manning that kiln and you know, bringing it up from whatever the temperature is outside. If it's January and it's minus 10 and we're starting and that's where it is to up to 2400 degrees. And then we'll hold it there. The train kiln will hold at temperature for about 14 hours at 2400 degrees to, to, to really lay that uh, glaze surface on there. And the Anagama will hold it there for something like 36 hours. So kind of depending on what's going on with the kiln, we do a lot of things, but we're there around the clock and we have to maintain what's going on, kind of paying attention to specific things because if nobody's there, 
it goes out and then we have a very serious problem so we work with my beginning students are working with advanced students and uh, and that's really nice I have beginning students that are you know 18 years old that are working with professionals that are you know presidents of banks different things so there's a lot of an educational process that happens beyond just making clay which is which is very nice is they get a they get to work with a lot of different people and they get to find out what they have to do to come together to a, to achieve a common goal as well so um, the different processes in here these are these are the exact same clays just in a different spot in the kiln as well so there's no glaze on either one any of these three here they're just in a different spot in the kiln so you can get these different zones that will really give you a, a, a much varied palette which is which is very very interesting um, clay body again that's the uh, Laguna B mix wood fired B mix that uh, I was fortunate enough to develop with a Laguna clay company and so it just gives me a, a very nice varied palette so uh, learning how the kiln responds I can get this and this this area of the kiln that and that area of the kiln so I can set things up to do to, to do a number of, of different uh, um, results and, and that that to me is pretty exciting because there's never any that are exactly alike bourbon bottles flasks it is a it is a very much an American um, drink and uh, it's it's something I'm, I'm very interested in is is uh, you know sitting down the it's kind of like the front porch mentality nobody really collects people don't gather very often anymore we're, we're so fast we got to get this our, our my, my texts aren't coming in quick enough I'm not getting my information quick enough and and really it's a way to connect with people it's a, it's a, a form that I'm very interested in and with the fact it's it's a way to, to kind of slow things down have a have a uh, um, a cocktail with a, with a friend, tell a story, you know, really a way to connect with one another. And, and that I think is, is, is a very interesting thing. You know, we, we don't get our food fast enough. We don't get our, our information quick enough and, and trying to slow down all of those processes and kind of remove away from that and connect with people again, I think is, is a, um, a really nice thing. Hi, I'm Randy Carlson and uh I teach at Bradley University, I teach ceramics there, I've done art appreciation and uh, 3D design and all those kinds of things. Um, I'm in charge of the ceramics area, so right now that's, that's where I'm, I'm mostly focused in terms of my teaching career. My, my ceramic career goes back to, I guess, really uh, student days, like a lot of people, and have an introduction to what this stuff is all about. And I think ceramics to me is something that has um, impressed me by the way that it has such physical change. And that's one of the reasons that uh, I find it so intriguing and magical and, and, and drives me, you know, even to today. Um, these pieces that are here in this show are kind of an amalgam of uh, forms that emerge over time. And I've made forms um, that were like this um, in recent years and decided that um, rather than um, have them be sort of a continuous single thing in the end, um, I would divide them up and create the idea of positioning them in a, a variety of ways if you wanted to. and. Um, and then also to lead the eye around, I've, I've given them a, a little bit of a graphic touch um, that actually goes and continues on inside these spaces. So whether or not these are butted together and they go to, as one single continuous thing or they're spaced out or even, you know, you can move them a little bit along this axis as well. They have uh, an interesting sort of interplay of what's going on on the surface um, in terms of the volume, the overall relationship of the form as a collective, uh, and all those kinds of things. So, so I guess in a way, uh, for me, part of the real content for me is all of these things that come together in terms of, you know, it's about form, maybe number one in my mind, and making forms that have some sort of interesting sculptural stance, relationship, activation of space, whatever it might be. Um, and then what happens in terms of 
this stuff in a, in a process, in a kiln with materials on the surface, that kind of thing. So I've done a lot of work for other people. I've worked in commercial potteries. I've made uh, things uh, at the wheel all day long for a number of years. Um, and so, you know, I think that in a way, at this stage in my career, to be invited and be in a group like this has been sort of a, a long time coming in a way, but it's been about the idea of growing the skills and growing the knowledge and growing the, the kinds of, um, you know, just uh, overall awareness and having this stuff bubble from a context, being aware over a long period of time of work from all kinds of places all over the world, um, culture kinds of input, um, individual um, work that's done by um, a variety of artists from all kinds of places. One of the things that's been able to feed that for me as, a, as an academic is the ability to take students to uh, foreign venues and teach art appreciation and go to museums and, and to have some travel that uh, I was able to do um, sort of uh, on my own to um, important sites. I've been to Japan, I've been to Europe, I've been to Mexico, North Africa, a variety of places, and I've been able to get to some of the major museums that have huge collections of, of antiquities and, and ceramic work from early cultures. So that overall exposure to this as, a, as an art form, as a craft, as a, as a way to develop sort of, you know, civilization is all part of what kind of files through my head when I'm setting down to make you know, some forms. So um, these things are not done out of a vacuum, but they sometimes come somewhat spontaneously and there's you know, some sort of a, an idea that flashes from somewhere that's come from someplace um, and it reflects and it, and it becomes, I think, in some degree, a part of a continuation. Um, and part of the legacy, part of the, the tradition that's uh, been going on for, from the beginning, 30,000 years plus. So um, whether it's a pot in the end or it ends up being more of a sculptural form, and maybe like these, they're, they're pots but they're sculptural forms too. And, um, and I like that idea of trying to design pieces that are somewhat unique. I think in the end, where I'm, I'm thinking mostly now in my mind that my work has maybe some relationship to some modernist forms, um, some forms that maybe come out of the arts and crafts era, some forms that maybe come out of, I don't know, even like traditional salt glaze pieces and things like that. Because oftentimes the pieces that I make start out as very sort of like crock type forms, really straight sided. Um, beginnings and then they're pushed and manipulated and reshaped and reassigned um, in a variety of ways to end up the way they do. So what the, the way the form like this um, comes and, and, and ends up this way is, is basically I've, I've, I've kind of come to a point where my work is it's wheel thrown for the most part and I could make this probably from slabs just as easy, but you know, I like the wheel and it's, it's, a, it's an expediter. It makes things happen fairly quickly. And <clears throat> so this is basically started out as a cylinder form, slightly taller than what this main basic form on the bottom is. And uh, then it's, it's thrown without a bottom so I can cut it free and I can squeeze it into sort of this general sort of profile uh, in terms of this footprint. And then I'll make a template with paper and I'll, I'll decide and find some sort of an arc form that I can bring these two edges together and join them. So if you can envision this form without these spouts as one continuous form as a closed thing, um, that's how it starts out. And um, then I, I, I add these sort of necks, I guess I would call them. Uh, some people might call them spouts. Or they, some people may think of them as almost like chimneys or something. But, uh, but I think of these as sort of separate vases when they're all said and done. And so we'll call them necks. And 
So I, so I add these on, and then I literally just take and cut this one piece at a time and remove it and add a slab on both ends. And then I'll cut the next one and do the same thing and the next one and do the same thing. So then I have to do whatever I need to to finish and blend this to make it one continuous you know, sort of form again when they're, when they're sitting together. But ultimately in the end when this is all, all um, realized then I do know that I can kind of manipulate these by moving them around and I can stagger them, I can keep them apart and again it shows a little bit of the you know the design, the line that continues on on these surfaces and uh, so it's uh, you know it has that idea for uh, you know just the, the idea that uh, there's more than just what's on the surface here and uh, it can be played with, it can, can be you know, it, dis it can be displayed in a variety of ways. Like I was talking about with the, with the other forms in the show that uh, I've got here, um, these pieces have a certain modular sort of relationship as well. They're essentially similar, almost identical forms. Um, they're done on the wheel when I start out. Um, I use a little template to sort of standardize the way that these will be altered. And then I added the Nexon as separate pieces and join it all together as one. Um, as I made these, I mean, I had an idea. I had a sort of a plan right from the get-go and kind of conceived them in a different arrangement than what's here on the pedestal. And the slide in the, in the catalog is really the way that it sort of bubbled up in my head. To me, I think this is a perfectly great way to show them too. But, um, when I conceived of these and I thought about these, um, I thought about not only the forms as they, as they came out, um, but also the spaces in between. So um, I refer to the, to, the, to the name of these as vases and spaces. Um, and part of it is that, you know, if we arrange these as they were in the image, there is a sort of a negative form that kind of mimics what these positives are uh, in between them. And there's also a suggestion of the idea of a vase, a long neck vase, as a poured design on the surface of these interior uh, areas as they're displayed here on these pieces. So the idea of this sort of long neck and, and a, a vase form in, on the base is reinforced over and over, um, and not only in the form, but on the surface and uh, in the overall uh, with the arrangement in the catalog it has another sort of variation of that kind of, uh, of a composition uh, in terms of the way that the forms repeat and repeat and some sort of variation. I use a salt blaze um, kiln for uh, firing these things and my surfaces are arrived with basically two glazes that I've been using over maybe the past 15 years. And uh, there is some added element to what I do with those glazes by spraying some titanium dioxide on the surface uh, before they go in the kiln. So there is a, a change in the response in the kiln in terms of creating a bit more of a matte surface uh, oftentimes with that titanium dioxide. But it also expands the palette considerably in terms of it adds in some more of the creamy colors, the tans, and, the, and almost uh, white colors that can come in. And uh, so it, uh, it adds to the, to the variable quality on the surface. I love that atmospheric sort of thing that happens in a salt kiln um, under these conditions. And that's why I've been using it um, over and over and over again for as long as I have, because the the limit to these variations hasn't really happened yet. I, I still get new results all the time. And so um, that is also a, an intriguing part of, of, of what I do. It's the exploration of how these materials change in the process. So, you know, form, material, and process are really the things that drive what I do and in terms of ceramics and the ever-changing nature of what the results versus expectation versus, um, you know, surprise and, and, uh, and uh, 
serendipity is really the thing that makes ceramics very exciting for me.